Well, good morning, New Gen, and welcome to this morning's Sunday Scrum. Morning, New Gen. For those that don't know us, it's nice to say us this morning, <laughs> is that uh, my name is Michael, and this is my beautiful wife, Kerry. Thank you, my love. And it's so nice to have her joining me this morning to do these announcements and host this morning's uh, Sunday Scrum. And so, yeah, she brings more radiance and joy. And I think he's trying really hard to earn some brownie points. I You've got to take why. the brownie points whenever you can. Yes, so we have to be quite those. careful as to why. You are trying so hard. Yes. And so, anyways, coming back to the church and New Gen and less about us, um, we would like to make a big announcement. And the big yes. announcement is we are able to meet together in each other's homes, That's which is amazing. fantastic. Yes. So, those that um, missed last week's Sunday Scrum and haven't caught up yet, there was a big announcement, and the announcement was that we are able to meet in each other's homes. So I remember when lockdown happened, Haley came to me, my four-year-old, and she was she was devastated because she cannot <laughs> touch people. Like that was the hardest thing for her to understand yeah. that uh, you are unable to touch anybody now. And she just was so desperate to touch people. But um, that doesn't mean now that we're physically able to meet with each other. You still try and refrain from touching each other, please. <laughs> so enjoy the moment of yes. being with each other. I think it's just going to be absolutely, I think it's going to be amazing. Other people than you in my home. That is true. It's lovely. Yes. And also for those people that are not comfortable with actually yeah. getting together, we just want to make it quite clear that um, you're not, it's, not, it's not compulsory to yeah. get together. You are more than welcome to keep yourself isolated yeah. and um, connect with your life group or whatever it might be via Zoom. Yes. And um, yeah, so just uh, let your life group leaders know or anybody know that, that you prefer not to do that. And um, yeah. Yeah, no pressure. There's no pressure no at all. Pressure. You can carry on as normal watching the Sunday Scrum on a Sunday. We're still going to be here. We're not going anywhere. Yeah. And so yeah, there's no pressure for anybody with that. Yeah. And then we'd like to encourage people with regards to people that are meeting together um, to pray for one another and mm. to uh, break bread with one another and um, just get that sense of community going again. Cook a good meal for each other. Yes. Choose your groups wisely, people. <laughs> Choose it. The I'm, ones that can cook well, you know. Yes. Uh, Michael, out of, out of Chef Michael, is the group is probably full, but there is Kaz, there is Minette, there yes. is Claudie, there is no, Jenny some Robinson, great cooks in there's some this great cooks in this church. Mm -hmm. And so, really um, send us a text. We'll tell you exactly <laughs> whose house to go to. <laughs> All yeah. right. And anyways, and then we have virtual prayer. That's right. So that happened two months ago, I think, where we kicked off virtual prayer. And it was such a success. It was just so beautiful. So what that is, if you haven't done it before, is literally virtual prayer as it is. It's a 24-hour a prayer group that is yeah. online and you go you find your slot you put your name in and where you've allocated like a time if you want to pray at one o'clock in the morning then you slot in there one o'clock michael mason and you'll be praying for however long you want you can choose a half an hour you can choose an hour slot whatever you prefer and what will happen is you will receive an email an hour before your prayer time and it will just give you guidelines as to what you should be praying for so it's just really really good yeah. um unfortunately i think because i tried to sign up on a slot and they didn't let me so i had to go to a later <laughs> slot i have put my name down but the all the good slots are taken i'm sorry yes. carrie will be so. interceding i'll be intersleeping yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike's going to sleep. <laughs> so sign up, guys. We're actually not going to run it for one week. We're going to run it from the 30th of September to the 13th of September. So, That's amazing. Which is great. So if you have a signed up for the one week, scroll down, and I'm sure it allows you to scroll to the next page and just get your names in. And let's just pray. Yeah. The basis of church should be built on yeah. prayer. So and and building on that exactly what Kerry is saying, we just came out of the prayer group and, yeah. the, and the prayer course, sorry, and for the last eight weeks, it's been phenomenal. Amazing. You know, we've had so many amazing testimonies of people sharing and strengthening their prayer muscles. And so we're just yeah. continuing a continue. What is continuing. It? continuing okay. sorry <laughs> continuing this whole um movement around yeah. prayer and so um it's the foundational uh, aspect of our christian walk with god yeah. you know and so we just want to encourage that and then um uh, we have the spring day prayer meeting as well on the first awesome. september and so you can yeah. get all the details are on our facebook page yeah. and so jump into facebook we're going to be doing that uh, via zoom yes and so that's going to be great yeah, so, join that i mean yeah. it's so great because you get to just be part of a bigger community and you're praying together it's yes. 
it's so good when we just see each other's faces and we know that we're joining in a moment of prayer and I think yeah. it's just to be part of something you feel so disconnected when we don't see each other or we're not yeah. connecting so fight for those moments plug in join in for the virtual uh, prayer groups for zoom meetings for your life groups just plug yeah. in it's just so important yeah and then obviously the spring day prayer yes and the spring day prayer all right, and then, so that's prayer, and then, um, so from the rhythm of our, our prayer groups, or the prayer course groups, mm. um, we've decided to launch Alpha again this year, and um, I think it's it's a great initiative, mm. and so um, in that note, on, or on that note, um, just turn your attention to your screens, and we're going to play a video for you, and then you will see these lovely faces again. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with, is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. You know, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strived to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, would be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith and meaning. It's us again. <laughs> Hi, so that's Alpha. And it, um, it's amazing. Alpha is absolutely amazing. It's been run at New Gen, uh, I think, quite, uh, quite a few times. Yeah. And we've seen amazing uh, people's lives transformed by it. We know of a couple personally that came to Alpha and are now just an amazing leadership couple yeah. or in leadership. So there are just, there are so many stories of people that have attended Alpha yeah. and lives have been changed. So yeah. Alpha is a great tool. Yeah, it's a great tool to present Jesus to people that mm. don't know him or experience exploring him or that you feel that you could encourage people to come mm. to know Christ or to come to know Jesus in, in, in our faith. And it's a non-threatening way. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's so it's a great way. Uh, and then also for those that um, that are saved or yeah. those that are Christ followers, it's a great time just for an enrichment. Um, yeah. Every time you listen to a course, you always pick up certain little things. Like in the prayer course, yeah. Kerry and I, we, we know we thought about prayer. We knew a whole lot about prayer, but there were certain things that we learned through the prayer course. Yeah. And so you never stop learning. You never stop learning. You never exactly. Exactly. So, so it's for everybody. And yeah. so we'd like to encourage you guys to get involved. And there's three ways you can get involved. The first one is through your existing prayer groups. So if you've been running a prayer group or you belong to a prayer group, you could just 
transition Transition. into an alpha group and then um, if you would like to uh, step out in faith and and give it a go um, to lead a group and we'd like to encourage that you know give it a go invites unsafe friends or people that you know um, neighbors or whatever it might be. It's actually a great time to step out because you just have you have such a backing of. We're allowed to now so which is even better (laughs) we're actually allowed to get into our homes. So, But you've got this backing of videos and uh, there's just so much information it's like this all the resources are there. Yeah. Hand it to you, and you just have to facilitate it. Exactly. Uh, what a what an easy transition into leading a group, yeah. and yeah, God has called us to. Come on, Jen, let's do it. Let's lead, activate right? the gifting, and let's get going. Let's let's yeah. lead the church, and let's bring people into the kingdom. Yeah. And then the third way of getting involved is uh, on the thirtieth of September. Yes, there is a, a online, online premiere. Launch. So you invite the people that you think would be interested in attending Alpha and just invite them to the 30th of September and say, guys, come take a look in, no pressure to sign up, whatever it is. And after that, if they feel they want to continue or commit, then they can commit. So invite them to the online premiere on the 30th of September, let them look in, tell them to come and just check it out. And after that, they can make the decision. So yeah, it's, it's just so easy. It's done for us. Invite them and I'm sure people would love to attend. Yeah. Exactly. Come on, Nijen, let's do it. Let's mm. let's see the Holbrook Basin being saved for the glory of Jesus Christ. You yeah, know, we amen. can all we don't don't have to be a preacher on a platform, we can all get involved in some way. Yeah. And so um, yeah, we just want to encourage you to do that. And then um, we have Taste and See. Yes. And Taste and See has been going really, really well. And we just want to encourage people to keep on giving. Yeah. Uh, they are still very hungry people. People have still lost jobs, people have been retrenched. Uh, money is drying up and so um, if you are in a, in a place of strength where you have finances we would like to encourage you to give yeah. to those that are hungry and so um, it's, it's a great initiative and we've just seen so so many amazing things happening mm. and then with regards to that we would like to encourage people that if you have time on Monday mornings, uh, on Monday mornings at 8 30 a.m come and pack veggies that's it's right. lots <laughs> of fun we have we make well you actually make it quite fun you have a little bit of a competition who can untie the bags the fastest who can pack the veggies the fastest but at the same time we also build in a relationship it's a great way to see yeah. other people and we just yeah you just get to be part of packing veggies but then you know that your contribution is made to help yeah. people that are in need so yeah it's yeah. really good and thank you for those that have have been given yeah. it's just been amazing to see so many families um being fed yeah. it's just incredible yeah. Yeah. awesome and that is all the announcements there's a lot, lot hey? we did it we did it well done Kerry. high five give me a well done and so um this morning now we can uh get into a time of worship and uh, we're just going to pray mm. and um, yeah, let's have an encounter with our Heavenly Father this morning. And um, we know He is good and we know mm. He is faithful. He is generous and He is kind. He is merciful. He is full of grace. He's full of power. And um, yeah, let's just feel the warmth of His love yeah. as we worship Him and we lift Him up in this time. So shall we pray? Yeah. You want to pray for us? Super. Yeah, Father, I thank you, Lord, that as... As your people, we just come with our hearts open to receive from you this morning. I thank you, God, that every person that is tuning in, Father, is just sitting expectant to receive this morning. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and you would invade the homes of the people that are watching in this morning. I thank you that even now as we just worship you, my God, that as we give you adoration and praise, God, that our hearts are open to receive that which you want us to receive. And we step into a space, Father, where we just turn our eyes to you. I pray, Holy Spirit, you come and you bring healing to those that need healing, restoration to those that need restoration. And we thank you right now, my God, that you receive all the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, Amen, church.
cross would offer his only son Who else invites me to call him father Only a holy Where we hear worship, he hears. 
So that was amazing. Uh, I absolutely love worship and I love to be able to be worshiping next to Mike because I've always wanted to be part of the band, but he's never let me. So now I am his only band member. <laughs> yeah, but we love worship. Worship is so crucial to our lives and yeah. yeah, just to be able to do it. I think it's amazing. Absolutely. And so now that we've entered into the presence of God, we get to hear the preach this morning. And mm. so uh, I think we have the three amigos or the three musketeers or whatever it might yeah, be. I like the three amigos. <laughs> and so um, Steph, Kaz and Brian this morning will be sharing with us. And uh, so lean in this morning and be blessed by it. Yeah. Well, a very good morning, all you fantastic people. I imagine that there are a couple of you out there who, for the first time since lockdown began, are doing a Sunday scrum with someone other than your immediate family. Maybe it's uh, uh, your life group, your prayer group, your extended family, maybe it's friends, or maybe it's your neighbor. But either way, you're sitting there with someone else. Uh, and if that's you, I want to ask you just to savor this moment, just to, just to really celebrate the fact that you're fellowshipping with others this morning. Uh, and that's really, truly amazing um, and something that I don't think we should take lightly. Uh, and more than that, I want to encourage you to come and maximize it. Why don't you take time to pray together this morning and why don't you also maybe take time to break bread together? Well, if we jump back all the way to just before lockdown, we were busy with a series called Rule of Life. And the premise of this series was that God has invited each and every person to relationship with him not religion not dry sanctimonious mechanical religious engaging with god but vibrant living deeply fulfilling relationship with him in fact jesus describes this relationship as a vine in john chapter 15 verse 5 he says i am the vine you are the branches whoever abides in me and i in him he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing in fact, when I preached through this earlier in the year, I had a granadilla vine with me up on stage to come and demonstrate or show the, the kind of relationship that God wants us to live in and to, to experience. And, um, and just like that granadilla vine, God wants our relationship with Him to be, to be organic and living and unforced and natural and ultimately fruitful. And so I've got a, a granadilla a bush or vine or tree, I don't know what you call it anymore, back home. And uh, it's kind of grown up the wall and over the wall and over the neighbor's Wendy house and up the neighbor's tree. And it's just huge. And every year it just has hundreds of granadillas that it produces. And it's a wonderful picture of the, the relational life that God uh, invites us to and the potential that lives inside of us as believers. But you'll notice there that I said that it had grown up the wall and over the wall and the Wendy house and up the tree. And, and this granadilla bush used all of these inanimate behind the scenes structures to lean on and depend on and grow up on in order for it to become as big as it was and to bear as much fruit as it did. Uh, of course, we could have taken all of that away and it would have still li lived and survived and, and, you know, had a couple of granadillas, but it would never, ever have been as fruitful as it was, as it is. And so this is, I guess, the premise for rule of life is that we want to come and recognize that there's this organic, living, vibrant relationship that God invites us to. But there's this behind the scenes kind of structure that we need to tend to and make sure is in place in order for us to grow that life as big and to be as fruitful as possible. And that behind the scenes structure is what we call rule of life. And so Ken Shigematsu, the author of a book called God in My Everything, says a rule of life is simply a rhythm of practices that empowers us to live well and grow more like Jesus by helping us experience God in everything. And so a rule of life is simply a process of taking time to look at every area of your life, inviting God into that and allowing him to come and convict you around areas that you need to sharpen up on or change. And then to take those and to pray through them and to format a rule of life, a behind the scenes kind of structure that, that the relational potential and the relational organic space of your life with God can begin to grow up and through, up, and, up on and through. 
Uh, and, so, and so during uh, that series, we put out a life group curriculum that looked like this. And you'll see there, there's these four different sections with three subsections to each. And in that time, uh, each week, Kaz, Brian, or myself preached one of those weeks. And we took time in the life groups to come and then talk through them. Uh, and to talk through those different areas and to fill them out. Uh, and to put some of the convictions that God had laid upon us down on there. And so, of course, you can go... Uh, and listen to those preachers in full. But this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to recap that entire series very briefly. And we're going to take time to interactively come and fill out some of these, uh, some of these boxes or some of these things. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to come at the end of this and fill out our own rule of life. And so this is what a rule of life can look like. This is Ken's rule. And um, if you look carefully there, you'll see that his rule is unique and particular to him. No one else can come and have this rule. And so, uh, and so um, it's not a religious rule. It's a, it's a living and vital and dynamic kind of rule that we're talking about. We also need to recognize that in his rule there, he, d- he hasn't covered all 12 areas. He's allowed God to come and convict him around those which are most important. Uh, and then we can also see that um, that his rule is seasonal and our rules need our rule of life needs to be seasonal dependent on what's happening in life what time of year it is what stage of life we're in and we need to be able to adjust it according to that Uh, and finally we need to understand that um, that this rule of life is not meant to replace our relationship with god it's simply meant to sit in the background and help foster and develop and grow our relationship with God into something big and fruitful. The full potential, according to the full potential that God has put inside of us for that. And so this morning we're going to take a stab at going through this. And right now I want to ask you to um, go and grab a pen and paper. Or maybe you've got your old life group curriculum. Or maybe you've got a... Um, uh, uh, electronic version of it you can even go onto the website or Facebook and download it now if you want Uh, but I want to ask you to take a minute now go grab a pen and paper or something that you can write some stuff down on because we're going to go and reformat a rule of life for the season ahead Great. Well, it was my privilege in week one to kick us off. And uh, I touched on the first element of the rule of life, which was roots, which was made up of uh, Sabbath, prayer and sacred reading. And so starting with the Sabbath, I want to run through these quickly. And so what is the Sabbath? Well, I think we all know that, uh, you know, in the context of the book of Genesis and in the context of Exodus and the Old Testament, that that six days are for working, but on the seventh day we must come and rest. And I, I think there's a whole bunch of people that think, oh, this is a good idea, or it's only weirdos that practice or observe the Sabbath. But there's something profound about the Sabbath that, that I was reminded about at the end of last year, the beginning of this year. And not just me, but there are many folk uh, in other churches preaching through this and becoming convinced and convicted around it. Uh, many books coming out and being published around it. But but more than that, I feel like in the context of this pandemic season and in the context of lockdown, that there is a bigger issue of rest that God is calling us to. Uh, and the issue and the call to a Sabbath is not one to come and follow a religious law as much as there is wisdom of coming and resting, resting in God and God resting in us. And so I'm going to resist speaking too much into this because I think next week we need to take a full um, a full 30 minutes and just dive into the Sabbath and why it's important for us. And so I'm going to leave that one there and move on to number two, which is prayer. 
And so again, we've just been busy with the prayer course. And so I don't think I should say too much about praying. Uh, but I think we'd all be convinced as to the value of prayer. And I think we'd all be convinced as to the importance of prayer. And I think we're probably all praying a little bit more off the back of prayer course and as well as off the back of this current season than we have ever before. And so it was Richard Foster that said this, Prayer catapults us to the frontier of spiritual life. Of all the spiritual disciplines, prayer is the most central because it ushers us into perpetual communion with the Father. And so it was R.C. Ryle that said that prayer is the surest mark of a true Christian. And he said this because of this concept of perpetual communion with God. You see, God didn't design us to come and to engage with him through a third party priest. He didn't design us to engage with God through uh, dry, mechanical, religious and sanctimonious practices. But he designed us to engage with him like Adam and Eve in the garden, relationally, conversationally. And the way we do that is through prayer, uh, con conversational, contemplative prayer, talking with God. And so I don't know of any relationship that works and that thrives that is devoid of, of any kind of conversation or correspondence that there might be. And so it's the same with us. And that's why R.C. Ryle says it's the surest mark of a true Christian. Because as soon as you come into a relationship with God, you begin from an overflow of that relationship to begin to talk with Him. And so Jesus in Matthew 6 says, when you pray, it's not this commandment, you should pray. It's not this, this suggestion, if you pray. It's this expectation that you simply are going to pray as an outworking of your relationship with God. And so, and so your prayer can look uh, any number of ways. And the prayer course has been so helpful for this. And so it could be just a conversational space through the rhythm of the day. It could be setting aside time. It could be praying through Psalms. It could be the, praying the daily office. It could be praying the, the, the uh, prayer of examen. It could be any number of things. Family prayers, prayers before dinner. Um, it, it could be anything. But we've got to recognize the importance of prayer. And we need to come and put a rule of life in the background to ensure that we get to this as a priority. And, uh, and so it's a worthwhile reminder here to talk about the virtual prayer room that we've set up and to call you to go put your name down there to come and help you uh, work out and practice this uh, rule of life, but also to come and partner with us, uh, with us as a community. And so number one, Sabbath, number two, prayer, and number three, sacred reading. And so what is sacred reading? Well, of course, it's God's Word, the Bible. And so we need to understand that the Bible, God's Word, is God speaking to us, that He can literally speak to us. And the Bible calls it His Logos Word, His, His written Word. It's the message of God that is given to us, that we have access to at any time, in any place. It's hard to think that there are many nations or many people in the world who don't have a Bible, have access to a Bible. And it's so easy for us to pick up and to hear from God telling us who he is or, or for him to come and give us wisdom to life as, as to how we should live. And so two weeks ago, I spoke from the armor of God about the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word. And I spoke around how, how the Logos, word of God, Bible, is, is something that we need to come and soak ourselves in and give ourselves in to. And this is what rule of life is about, is coming and, and soaking ourselves in the Logos, word of God. It's the written word. It's the message of God. But as we do that, we need to know that there will be moments in life where we need something extra, a little bit more, where things are tough or difficult and and it's from soaking ourselves in God's word, in his Logos word, that through his spirit, he comes and quickens that word from the Logos word to a rhema word. That it's as if from, from the scripture we're reading, it's as if he's speaking to us directly and particularly for that very situation that we're in. And so, and so I want to encourage you to go and, and determine to spend time soaking up God's word, his Logos word, sacred reading. And so with that in mind, we're going to take a minute now and uh, two minutes now. And I want to ask you just to jot down some thoughts, some convictions, some things that God's working through in your heart.
Hi guys, so I spoke about the second aspect of the trellis which um, involves our relationships with other people and how do we steward our relationships in such a way that glorifies God and honors others. And so there were three aspects and I'm going to start with sexuality as the first aspect mainly so that I can get it out the way. Um, you know, the world would have you believe that your sexuality is something for you, something that's selfishly for your own pleasure, but that's not at all what the Bible teaches us. And so the worldview and the biblical view are, are two opposing things. And it seems like the world never stops talking about sex and it seems like the church doesn't talk about it enough. And so we don't want to fall into that trap. Um, the reality is that our sexuality is a, a core part of who we are. It has a disproportionate um, potential to to do damage, to obliterate our lives. And so it's something that we have to handle really carefully um, as something which can glorify God um, and honor other people. And so two really practical things here. Number one, apply wisdom. I mean, it's as simple as that. Apply wisdom. Be realistic about your own weaknesses, your own temptations. Um, put things in place to protect you, whether that's um, agreeing on some kind of curfew with your boyfriend or girlfriend, or whether it's um, putting technology in, in place, software in place, so that you're not going to view certain things on your device. Um, it almost certainly means having a few honest conversations um, and increased accountability with a godly friend. We're all, we're all facing similar battles and, and I think uh, we do well to just be honest about that. Um, the second thing is to embrace God's view on sexuality and on marriage. Um, God's view of marriage is so high. It's, he, he holds marriage in such high regard and we have no place, we have no place um, being dismissive about our own marriages or the marriages of anyone, the marriage of anyone else. If, if we're going to take the biblical view, if we're going to take God's view, then, then we hold marriages in high regard. And then finally, it's taking God's view on sexuality in such a way that it colors our attitude, it colors our actions, it, it, colors, it colors our words. Um, so we don't take the world's view on things like pornography and modesty. We take God's view. And that's just common sense. And really, I'm very glad that topic's out the way. Let's move on, shall we? The next um, aspect in, and under this thing of relationships is family. Um, how do we steward a faithful family? I see what I did there with the alliteration. Uh, we spend so much time building our empires. Um, we, we are building our savings accounts. We are growing our careers. We are building our profiles. And it's easy in that kind of world to forget that actually our greatest assets are our family. And this, this, this isn't just true of um, Christ followers. This, this is, seems to be a universal truth that at the end of the day, what matters to people is actually family. And we don't want to forget that along the way. And as Christ followers, we, we have a, an added imperative, which is, which is to um, steward our families in a way that brings glory to God and honors people, honors the people within our family and, and honors the people who interact with our families. And so how do we live out our family lives in a way that, that we can achieve this, that we can be glorifying God? And so some practical tips. <laughs> We protect, protect some family time together, whether that is meal times, um, it might be the drive to school. I mean, I think back to growing up and one of the sweetest moments in my day was my dad driving me to school. It, you know, it's, it's easy to dismiss these, these daily rhythms as just practicalities, but there's, uh, there's so much potential in our daily rhythms to, um, to bless our kids. Um, so the other thing that we do is a family, uh, sorry, a, a weekly family night where a Friday night at this stage is pretty sacred for, for the Kramer household. And, and we really, really try very hard to keep that as a space for the five of us. And, and it's something that our kids can count on as quality time with their parents. The next thing is to serve and to give together. Ministry can't be something that's Steph's thing or Steph and Kaz's thing or mom and dad's thing. It's got to be a family thing. 
it, it's got to be something that we we embark on together we practice hospitality together it's not where possible and we're reasonable. We don't want to be pushing our kids to the side while we get on with things. We want to embrace our children as, as part of things. Uh, we pray with and for one another. So the most beautiful thing when, um, when someone in a family is sick and the, the child's first response is, can I pray for you? We've got to model that to our children. We serve and we give together. We give our children opportunities to be generous with with the little bit of finances that they have. We, we, we modeling generosity to them, we're calling it out of them. This is one of the ways that we're fostering faithful family. And then finally, we unite on mission. And so, as I said before, this, this, this can't be some kind of adult endeavor to live out the Christian walk. It's, it's, it's for each one of us. We know that Jesus loved children. And, just this morning, I came across something in um, Psalm 8. And funny enough, I've been reading Psalm 8 for several days and I've missed this. And then I saw it this morning and it just jumped out at me. It says, through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies. Isn't that quite something? When I think of trying to do church at home and it is so much easier if the kids are somewhere else during that time. But this is through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies. The praise of children and infants is no small thing. It's no, um, oh sweet, they're copying their parents. No, 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 no. This is something powerful in the spiritual. And so we, I think we need to take it a lot more seriously than most of us do. I know certainly I was convicted when I read this. This is something that we need to take so seriously. It is eternally significant and it warrants prayerful consideration of how we're going to steward this and then finally number three is godly friendships and when when i preached on this some months back it seemed that this topic had such a chord with people and i i can only think that the reason is that as adults i, I think that we fall into the trap of believing that godly friendships are a luxury something that's an indulgence something that we don't we can't justify spending time on but on the contrary what was jesus doing for the last few years of his life for the most impactful years of his life he spent his days with his best friends and so i don't think that godly friendship is a luxury i think it is a beautiful gift from god to us and it, i think it's something that um that we can um we we can long for and that we can ask god for and so if you don't have such friendships in your life, pray that God would give you those type of friendships. Put yourself out there. Friendships take time. They take intentionality. They take vulnerability. And then be a friend to others. There, there is so much to be said about godly friendships and the Bible is full of um, beautiful verses on this topic and and so if you're on the fence about whether it's it's something worth um, investing your time in see what the Bible has to say about it but I think just the very fact that God spent his days with his best friends is it's so powerful it's so compelling and uh, yeah it's such a joy so I want to encourage you to to seek out those godly friendships now as I've been speaking, God would have highlighted a few things to you. And I want to encourage you to trust his leading. We're going to take two minutes now and take, take some notes, jot down some thoughts um, as to what God has said to you now.
Great. Let's move on to the third component of our rule of life, which we've called restore, which includes body, play and money. And so starting with body, what do we mean there? Well, I think too many of us, and maybe all of us, have got a low view of our bodies. And so whether it's consciously or subconsciously looking in the mirror and saying, oh, my nose is too big, or the way we stuff food or junk food or uh, substance abuse down into our bodies or even abuse medicine or whatever it might be, I think there's a realm of possibility that we've got a low view of our bodies, that it's just this thing that we can abuse and use as we want. But when we come in and see how God views our bodies, we can't help but have a high view of them. Uh, And so Psalm 139 verse 13 says, For you form my inward parts. God form my inward parts, your inward parts. He knitted you together in your mother's womb, and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And so there isn't a a Made in China sticker on the bottom of your foot. If there was a sticker, it would say made by God, the God of the universe who created and made everything. And God doesn't make rubbish. And so if we're looking in the mirror and we're, we're saying, oh, my nose is too big, there's actually a sense of blasphemy in that. Where we come in and saying, God, what you made wasn't actually that good. And so, and so we need to understand, number one, we're a product of intelligent design. Number two, that your body isn't just good, it's very good. That, that, that when God made all of creation, he stopped at the end of each day and he said, it's good. But at the end of the sixth day with Adam and Eve, he didn't stop and say, it's good when he looked at them. When he made the pinnacle of creation, you and I, he said, it's very good. And so, number one, you're the product of intelligent design. Number two, not just good, very good. Number three, uh, God saw fit to incarnate himself into a body. And so when he came and, and Jesus Christ incarnated himself into this, this existence, into this life, it was in the, in, the, in the body of mankind. And so if it was good enough for Jesus, surely we've got to come and raise the bar a little bit and say, sure, I've got to look after this body a bit more. Number four, God saw fit to dwell in our bodies. Not only did he incarnate himself, Jesus, into, into a body, but God comes and dwells inside of us. 1 Corinthians six nineteen says, do you not know that your, t- your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, that God dwells inside of us? We've got a responsibility to steward this body. And number five, our bodies are not our own. And so it goes on and says, do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? whom you have from God, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. And so this is the call that God's calling us to, is to come and to use our bodies to glorify Him. And we can do that in three ways that I listed uh, previously, and I want to remind us of now. The first is sleeping. Make sure you get enough sleep. Don't abuse your body with too little sleep. Number two is what you eat. Make sure what you're putting in is good for you. Uh, Make sure that it's healthy and that it's good for your body and that you're not eating too much and not eating junk food or putting uh, crazy things inside of you that are not supposed to be there. Uh, And so number one is sleeping, number two is eating, and number three is exercise. And this is a call for us to get going, get busy, get get the blood pumping, get the heart rate going, get air in your lungs and get out there. And if it's a walk or a run or a hike, just get out there and get exercising because it's uh, good for your body. And so number one is your body. Number two is play. And so what do I mean by play? Well, I mean play like a child. Remember as a kid playing, I look at my children during this lockdown and they've just played so lovely, so wonderfully together. Uh, Their imagination games and uh, it's been wonderful to see. And it reminded me of my own childhood of just, you know, drifting away into another world with my toys or with my books or whatever it was. And God wants us to live in that space. He put that inside of us. And so there's a series available now. You can go on YouTube. It's called The Chosen. And it's a beautiful, uh, almost like docu-series around Jesus' life. And you can go watch it. And it's wonderful to see. But one of the things you see in it is is just how, um, how authentically they portray Jesus as someone who himself was having fun, where he was dancing, where he was eating food with friends, laughing together, making jokes, and, and this, this, there's a sense of him playing. But more than that, there's also this moment where he makes a little toy, carves a little toy for a little girl and gives it to her because, uh, for her to play with. And I, I think it's such a great metaphor for us that God hasn't called us to come and live a dry, boring 
morose life but to come and make time to play to have fun to go climb the mountain to go take photos to you know work on your stamp collection whatever it is whatever comes in and fills your tank dinner with friends a party a bra whatever it is there's the space that we need to have and so uh, number one is bodies number two is play and number three is money and so jesus said more about money than any other social issue uh, and um, and he, he said this because I think he knew and understood uh, that money has a has the potential. Money and possessions has the potential to rival God more than anything else. Uh, and so um, and so in Matthew chapter six verse twenty four he says, "No one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one." And despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. More literally it says you cannot serve God and mammon. And the root word of mammon is amon. Which means uh, something we put our trust in. And I think Jesus knew that, that money has the potential and the power more than anything else for us to come and put our trust in it. And so when he went to Zacchaeus' house and he left there after Zacchaeus said he'd give all the money back to those he had robbed and to the poor. Jesus said, you know, behold, salvation has come to this house today. And he said this not because we can buy salvation, but because money is a great litmus. It's a litmus test of where our heart is. Uh, and, uh, and in that moment, Jesus could see that he hadn't put his trust in money anymore, but he started to put his trust in God, in Jesus. Uh, and so we need to come and find that balance and fight for that balance. And so a helpful rule of life regarding money will be, uh, will not only liberate us from the grimy grip of money to better serve God and others, but we'll also begin to see money as a tool to do those two things better. And so with my kids, what we do every month is we give them pocket money and let's say it's 100 Rand. I go and get 10 10 Rand notes and I put it out in front of them and, uh, and I say, okay, girls, here we go. Here's the first 10 Rand. Where does this go? And they know that one goes to God. We give it to the church. And then the second 10 Rand, I say, where does this go? And they take that and they say, it goes into savings. And there's this little savings box that it goes into. And then the third one, I say, where does this go? And that goes into another pocket called generosity that they need to give away to someone who is in need. And then we pull out the final seven, ten rand notes and I say, and who does this go to? And with glee in their eyes, they say, to me. And so for them, they don't have anything to compare it to. That 70 rand is a lot of money to them. But hopefully I'm doing a couple of things here. I'm training them how to steward that money into the future. And this grid or this guideline that we've put in place would help them into the future to do that with their money. But also to understand that, that when you start out with that 70%, it seems like a lot. And to start out early, stewarding that money well, when you grow it from 100 to 1,000 to 100,000, that 70, 700, 70,000, it still seems like a lot when you start from the the small early beginnings that they're at now and hoping that they can grow it well. And so that's something we do as a family and we do it because we understand we've been blessed in order to be a blessing. And we try and mimic that same principle for Kaz and I in our own budget. And so with that in mind, won't you take a minute now, uh, two minutes now, just to consider what some of the things God is saying to you around your body, around you play, playing and also your money.
Good morning, folk. It's great to be here today, and we are now dealing with the fourth section of the rule of life. And uh, it's interesting that uh, the last time I preached on this, it was, it, it was the last Sunday we met in the refinery before lockdown. So it's great to be here. And this morning, I just want to recap on what I shared on that Sunday. And, uh, and we'll be looking at reaching out today, uh, which consists of work, justice, and witness. And starting with work, um, right in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 2, it says, The Lord took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and to keep it. God needed someone to work in his beautiful garden that he created. And so he, he put man there. So we see that work is not a result of the fall of man and the curse of sin. It is something that we were created to do, to work. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Therefore be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. That's very encouraging, isn't it? In Ephesians 2 verse 8, Paul says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Isn't that wonderful that God created us? It was his workmanship. And we are created to do good works. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we read, Do, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved of him a workman who does not need to be ashamed and correctly handles the word of truth. That is so important as believers that we, we work to, to, to please God and to, and to handle God's word with truth. Our work is part of our trellis where we grow our relationship with God. The second point was justice and the key verse was Micah chapter 6, verse 8. And God says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. What is justice? Justice is being ethical. It's being morally right. It's behaving in a way that is fair, that is equal, and that is balanced. And so James James 1 we read, uh, James says, Pure religion, undefiled before God the Father, is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. God wants us to reach out in incredible love and to love those that are without. The goal of any rhythm in spiritual practices is to immerse ourselves in the bottomless depth of God's love. So from the place, that place, we become people who truly love God and who love people. Loving God and loving people. And then the third point was witness. And uh, Jesus uh, deals with this at length in Matthew chapter 5 when he talks about us being light and salt. And Jesus he talks about being salt and how if the salt loses its savor, it is ineffective and irrelevant. And being a witness in school, in, in our workplace, in the community is vitally important because we have to project, we have to portray the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is so important because when we do that, we change the spiritual atmosphere in our workplace. So important that God has put you in a place there. And you might think, well, my, my boss is not saved and things are not right. God has put you there to be salt and light. He's put you there to, to release the power of God within you that you can change the situation there. And so that is so important as we are a witness to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And then finally, Paul speaks to his young son, his protege, Timothy, and he's come to the end of his life. And he, he's talking to Timothy and he's saying, Timothy, I want you to know that I fought the good fight, the good fight of faith. I've finished the race, the race that God set before me. 
and I've kept the faith. And now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have a longing for his appearance. He says, Timothy, during the years of my life, the most important thing was learning the rules of life. And Timothy, I've, I've shared these rules of life in the, the letters I've sent to the different churches. And I sent you copies and you know these things. And he says, the rules of life have formed a strong trellis of spiritual stability in my life that has enabled the vine of my life to grow up and produce wonderful life-giving fruit. And folks, today, as we um, ponder over these things, let's have a look today and, and look at are we living our life according to God's rules of life? Because when we do that, when we do that, our trellis is strong, the vine is strong, we draw nourishment from Jesus Christ, and we can be incredibly fruitful in the kingdom of God. God bless you. Thank you, Steph, Kaz, and Brian, for reminding us about the rule of life and that series that we went through. It was, it's powerful and it's, and it's um, so apt for, for this time that we're in right now. Yeah. And so, yeah, we were truly blessed by it. And so um, that yeah. brings, to us, brings a close to our session this morning. And yeah. uh, we just wanted to encourage you guys to uh, pray and break bread with one another and um, just be in a sense of community mm -hmm. and um, just lean into God even more right now, you know, and let the... Let the preach and let the worship and whatever's happened this morning just resonate with your hearts and just touch you and uh, let it transform you in, yeah. a, in an amazing way. Amen. And so shall we close off in prayer? Yeah. Amen. Let's pray for that. So Father, this morning I thank you for New Generation Church. I thank you, God, that we are growing from glory to glory, Father. That, Lord, that your anointing is upon each one of us, Father, because Christ, the hope of glory, lives on the inside of us. Thank you, Lord Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have given us the Holy Spirit to empower us, mm. to be bold, to have courage in our hearts, to lead lives, Father, that are faithful and glorious to you, Father, mm. that your name will be proclaimed across the nations, Father. I thank you, God, that with Alpha, that God, people be inspired to, to open their hearts to it, Father. And Lord, that we would see transformation happen in the mm. lives of people, Father. So, God, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for your gracing and your mercy, your goodness, your faithfulness, your kindness. 
just a good God. You're just yes. a faithful Father. We are so encouraged to call you our Father. Yes, and so Father. this morning, Father, we pray, pray a blessing over your yes, people this morning. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.